So let me just introduce the idea of Poisson regression and Poisson GLMs. So by now you know a lot about GLMs. And it's not too hard to imagine how other classes of GLMs will be specified. Um, you just have to make sure that you've mapped it in correctly. So, so take, think about a Poisson regression with, with one response. So what is, it gonna, what is a response going to be here? Um, one way to think about it is that I have a contingency table. And I have a number on each table. And that number is the response, right? So this, this is like, there's a count, nij. And I'm saying nij is distributed Poisson with some parameter mu ij. And my job is to estimate mu ij. So one way to think about the Poisson situation is it's the same contingency tables we've been looking at, just that instead of thinking of it as a multinomial distribution, we're thinking of it as a Poisson distribution. And, we're, and the, the, the thing that, the, the y variable are these cell counts. Right, so in this case, there'd be two, it'd be like an x1, x2, and we would say something like g of mu i, where i varies over the case, the six cases, is equal to beta naught plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2. Right. This is the sort of extra parameter if we were thinking about things in multinomially, this goes away because this is kind of the global n. Right? But this sort of tells me what's the overall, or this is not the overall rate, but it allows me to adjust the overall rate of arrival. And so this is kind of, you know, you think about the skier example, where instead of choosing a set of skiers, I sit at the bottom of the mountain, I watch the skiers as they come in, and I ask them, do you have a cold or not? Did you take vitamin C or not today? Right? That's this kind of model. Or what's one way to think about this model? And I'm trying to estimate the rate, not the effect, sort of, directly, but the estimate, the, the rate at which skiers of different types are, are, arrive, right? Maybe I think vitamin C is so good for you that those skiers make it down the mountain and the others don't, for example, right? So then, then, then I would have a co big coefficient for vitamin C. Um, so this is the rate for response, and you can think about this as talking about cells in a contingency table. Um, and we also have here that the, uh, the y, or the, the expectation of yij is mu ij. That's part of the Poisson distribution, and also its variance is mu ij. So what's g? There's two common choices of link function. Surprisingly, one is just the identity. Um, mu equals uh, you know, beta transpose x or x transpose beta, the inner product of those two. Um, surprise, I say surprisingly because, of course, that could go negative, and we don't want negative arrival rates. So what do we mean by that? We don't mean that it's literally true. We mean that um, in the region, the region or region of interest, right, the, the, these mu ij's are all positive, um, and, and the response is, is flat. Is, you know, it looks like that. Right? So the truth might be that, you know, of course, as it goes negative, maybe it just is zero or something. Right? And maybe it does something else over here. And so it's, we're not really saying that the, the, the true function is linear, because that wouldn't make any sense. We're just saying that if the region of the data that we're interested in, the link function looks like an identity function. And it can work well if we have, for example, non-negative data. Right? And, So by the way, if I did this um, skier example, and I made it, and I made a model like this, x2, and this was vitamin C, and this was cold. Which which log linear model? Or which which model for the two by two table that we've discussed earlier? Does that correspond to? Does 
maybe I should say this is g of mu, um, you know, ij, where ij is, there's four, I have a table, ski or not, or uh, cold or not, placebo or not, and I have mu11, one one, mu12, one mu21, mu22. Two two. So which model is which model is this correspond to models? We don't have that many choices for a, for a uh, two by two table. So if you just start guessing <laughs> with uniform probability, you'll eventually get the right model. It, yeah, it's kind of a conditional independence. That's right. Like an x y y z. Um, that's that's not a bad answer. Um, The, the funny thing here is that when we've talked about the contingency tables, right, we only had, we have an x, here's x and here's z, right? We didn't talk about y as being its own thing. We were just measuring counts, right? So if I compress this down to a model on x and z, what do I get? Well, that wasn't one of our models. We get the independence model. So this is actually an independence model in disguise, right? Two questions, what's this doing here, right? We said an independence model should only have two parameters, right? One for the marginal on X, one for the marginal on, one for the marginal on vitamin C, one for the marginal on cold, right? There's another parameter. Why is that there? We're just estimating counts here. That's the weird thing, right? So we've changed our point of view a little bit. And we're not estimating, this is not a conditional probability or an, an odds ratio or anything else. It's just a parameter for the number of count, number of the rate, rate of arrival for that, that thing. Okay, what if I took all of my uh, entries and I multiplied them all by 100? Would any of these parameters change? So in the, in the usual independence model, there's two parameters which correspond to the marginal probabilities, and neither of those changes when I multiply everything by 100, right? Here, I would argue something will change. This one. Okay. The new parameter is here because it, it accounts for the overall rate. We've switched implicitly from a multinomial sampling model to a Poisson sampling model. And so we have to have an, another parameter that, accounts, that allows me to adjust the overall rate, the sum, this number. Right. This number here, it's not that it's Poisson with, P, with beta naught because I have to adjust for this, but I can, I can make it fit by adjusting this. So that's why I get this new parameter. And if I wanted to change this to a model that wasn't an independence model, I would just add another interaction term. Okay, now, I, now this is the interaction term. So now this thing will correspond to, will, you know, will correspond to an odds ratio um, that relates these two things. So sort of ignoring this, this gives me a saturated model for a two by two table. Ignoring that, it's an independence model for a multinomial independence model, including this, allows me to adjust to make it a Poisson. Okay. Of course, it could be that this vector just happens to be zero, but um, conceptually, we need to include it. Um, well, like, uh, Px equals 1, Px equals 2, Uy equals 1, Py equals 2. So the idea, I don't know if this is going to answer your question, but the idea is that, you know, beta 1 governs this, 
beta 2 fixes this. Right? Once I know one of these probabilities, I know the other. Once I know one of these probabilities, I know the other. Um, and if I, if, my, if I treat my n as fixed, I'm done. Right? If I, that, in other words, if n is fixed, I get a multinomial model, which is n p, where p depends on, you know, p is, is um, I take the product of these probabilities, which I can get from these odds ratios, right? Or these, these parameters. If I allow n to vary, if n is random, then I need another parameter to account for, for that, right? So if, if a skier suddenly arrive at twice the rate, these marginal probabilities won't change at all. But I have to change something because suddenly this number is much bigger. And the, number, the, thing that I the variable that's left to change is this beta. So identity function is one of them. The other function that I can think about is the link, uh, as a link um, that's common is log. So log mu equals beta transpose x. Um, so for each unit increase in xj, this one says for each unit increase in xj, I add beta to the total. So this is like really kind of uh, how much do I have to add to get the number to be right. And in this one, for each increase in, in an x, I increase, I multiply my mu by, by some constant. In xj, mu j, or mu is multiplied by exp beta j. And if beta j is positive, it's increasing, and negative, it's decreasing. So the other kind of Poisson model that we might want to consider um, that has a different interpretation than the table slightly is one where we're explicitly modeling rates. So the idea is that I get data which has kind of an exposure component to it. So it might be something like, um, you know, I have, I have some factors like, you know, I don't know, gender and size. And then I have how much, you know, the rate of cancer or something, total number of samples. Um, and then within each class or within each observation, I have another quantity, which is like, if I think about, say, a radiation thing, it's something like, how long was this person exposed to the radiation? Or how many, if you're thinking about the you know, taking flights on you know, drunken airlines versus responsible airlines, it's like, how many flights did you take? Or how many hours did you spend in the air? How many hours did you spend driving? Right? And the idea with the Poisson distribution right, is that um, the, the, the rate is sort of constant over time, right? So we want to adjust the data, right? So in our skier example for, oh, let's do this here. Okay. So the rate is constant over time. We want to adjust the data for the, uh, the quantity of exposure. Um, we want to equalize the quantities of exposure. In other words, what we're really interested in is not the total um, uh, cases of lung cancer um, for smokers, but we want, we're interested in like, per year of smoking, right? the risk per year, or the, 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 the time a component was in service, or the number of hours. And that means that what we want to com compare is instead of y as a count, we want to have count per unit time as our, as our thing that we were interested in predicting. And so in other words, we're interested in you know, a mu, which is not literally a count, but it is, well, it is a count, but it's just a count adjusted for time. Um, and the difference between this and the other one is a little bit subtle, so um, I don't know, maybe just think about it a little bit to try to get it straight. Um, usually this has a log link, so we would say something like the log of uh, a rate, uh, yi over t, is beta naught plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2, right? But log of something divided by 
t, oh, let's call this mu, mu i um, is, you know, log of this, the same as log of that minus log of that. So I can adjust this to say log of mu i is equal to beta naught plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 um, plus log t. So you could think about this as being a, I have this final variable, which is a continuous variable, which is time of exposure, amount of period of time of exposure, or area of space. And what I've done is, instead of modeling that continuous variable as giving it its own beta, or grouping it or doing anything else, I've chosen a specific functional form for that. Right? I say that, that my rate, my, my count increases linearly with the amount of exposure that I have. Right? That's my assumption. Um, and so this thing is called an offset. And in the data that you see, you might have a situation where this, it's an offset because I just add it to the equation. It ends up being very simple. And the data that you see that offset might apply to each individual. Like you get data where it says, you know, hours of exposure, how long this person was in the tanning bed, or how many flights they took on, on this airline or whatever. And then, uh, or it might come with groups, right? You might be able to only say for a certain class, you know, this is about how many hours they spent doing this. Okay. Um, and so when we do these models, um, we basically just have to plug in an adjustment in order to get, in order to, to get a sensible answer. Otherwise, the count data will be totally overwhelmed by length of exposure, right? It just so happened that this group drove way more than the other group. It wasn't that they drove more dangerously. It was just, you know. Not that truckers are getting a lot of accidents to say, it's that they just drive all the time. Right? And we have to adjust for that in order to get any kind of sensible information about the causative factors. 